Um, welcome, uh, welcome everyone, and thanks again for joining us today uh, for this uh, virtual meetup organized by Data Council uh, London. I am David, and today's meetup is co organized by uh, Adam and I, and uh, with a lot of support from Anna and Pete from the Perrin uh, Data Council group, uh, who are in the call today as well. Um, and uh, we're very excited for the talks today uh, that, uh, we, that we have prepared for you. Uh, so hope you enjoy the session and learn a lot from our speakers, from IBM and Dremio. And just a bit of housekeeping. So we're recording today's session and the link to the video will be shared on the Meetup event page. Cool. So, a uh, very quick introduction to uh, uh, on Data Council for those of you who are new to this Meetup group. Um, so, uh, what is Data Council? Uh, Data Council, and first and foremost, it is a community of data enthusiasts and uh, practitioners, uh, be it engineers uh, or data scientists or analysts, um, who, um, oops, who. Uh, or basically anyone who is interested in uh, data. And uh, we organize events and conferences that focus on delivering uh, really high quality, uh, no nonsense technical talks. And the community starts out in the States, but it has grown really tremendously uh, across the world in the past few years. Now we have meetup groups in many major cities across the world. And uh, these groups are all run by volunteers uh, so, for instance, today's meetup is organized by the um, the London community, which is run by Adam and I. Um, we are both engineers. We really love uh, meeting people through these meetups and uh, hope to help to grow the data community in London as well. Uh, so if you're interested in organizing any future events or uh, giving a talk or sponsoring an event, uh, please do reach out to us as well. Great, so that is Data, data Council in a nutshell. Um, and today's meetup is uh, very kindly sponsored by IBM. We have team from IBM with us today. Um, team, would you like to say a few words? Sure, happy to. Can you hear me? Right, cool, yep. Um, awesome, all right. The stage is yours. Yes. So welcome, everybody. Excited to be here. I'm with the IBM Data Science Community team, uh, based out of uh, normally based out of San Francisco, um, California. I'm currently I live in San Jose. Um, uh, we are a place for um, data scientists, AI developers, machine learning engineers, um, and those who are aspiring to enter this exciting field uh, to share, learn, um, explore these uh, exciting new topics together. Um, we cover a lot of um, um, open source projects where IBM is involved in. Uh, we offer a lot of learning opportunities. Um, and you can check us out at the, uh, at the link provided there. We have a nice offering uh, for new members uh, to enjoy a, a complimentary month of uh, select IBM courses on Coursera. Um, so check it out. Um, I look forward to the talks. Very excited. Uh, and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, team. All right, so on to today's agenda. We have two talks uh, lined up. So first talk is on privacy preserving machine learning by Romeo, who is a chief data scientist at IBM Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. Um, Romeo will be, talking, uh, uh, will be telling us more about um, the techniques to deal with data privacy issue in machine learning which is uh, definitely a very important and relevant subject um, today. Um, and then we'll have the second talk, uh, which is on challenges when building a cloud-based cloud data lake. Um, and um, uh, it'll be given by Ryan, who is a principal consulting engineer at Dremio. And Ryan will be telling us more about the uh, modern data lake ecosystem, how things have shifted, and also some of the best practices to build a uh, data lake. So uh, also a quick note, because it is a virtual meetup, it might be a bit 
challenging to have questions um, uh, during the talk. So if you could um, you know, just type out your questions on the chat box uh, in this Google Meet, um, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end of each talk. Cool, so that's, uh, that's it for introduction. Um, and it's time for the first talk. Uh, and so please welcome Romeo, who will be talking uh, to us more about uh, preserving privacy in machine learning. Romeo, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome, okay. So let me try to share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to full screen mode. Let me know if you see the full screen. Can you see the full screen presentation? Uh, yes. Does, ah, it, okay. does it work for everybody? Adam, can you see it as well? Yeah, I see it in, um, in, um, in a small window. I don't know if that's... Right. Yeah, so I think for people okay. who might not see it on the main screen, so you might need to go uh, to the to the right of the window. And if you scroll down uh, on a list of people, you'll see, uh, oh, uh, yeah, just I, disappeared. I, yeah, I do. I share the entire screen. Then you might get my ah. screen. So oh, does it? Yep, I think it is going up. So now it should be full screen for you. Yep. 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 Thanks for the time. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So um, I don't have 45 minutes of material because I like discussion and also criticism and complaints. That makes me happy. So um, Tim is moderating the question. So you can type in any time. And please, Tim, if you feel it fits the context, just interrupt me and ask the question and I will just take it from there. Then we get more this meetup like feeling. Otherwise it's uh, maybe a bit boring. Okay, just interrupt me anytime. So I will cover um, two or three interesting concepts for privacy preserving AI. And this is federated learning and homomorphic encryption. So the state of the art is as follows. So you have your devices and they are sending a lot of data to the cloud. And on the cloud, a lot of queries are done and also machine learning models are trained and then they are deployed on the cloud and the device are querying the model. So that's how everything works nicely for everybody but we have caused a problem that's uh, data privacy so in the eu we have gdpr but in general people are more and more becoming aware of the fact that data privacy is important for a couple of reasons and one reason is uh, competitive advantage and uh, build of information cartels. And this in the past affected us slightly because um, if you Google for the term surveillance capitalism, this is actually describing the problem that you are known by some companies better than you know yourself and um but it's also affecting society in more critical ways just search for the term palantir and elections and you know what i'm talking about so federated learning is promising to be a solution for the problem so federated learning as you can see on this picture the data never leaves your device so that means the learning is taking place on your device and not only on your device, on a lot of devices. And somehow 
the learning is synchronized and the result of the learning is then pushed to the cloud. And from there, the model can be used. Just as a side note, there is also ongoing research that using such a deployed model, if you are in possession of the model, you can reconstruct the data. So just be aware that there might be a vector into the whole system. But as of now, let's consider this relatively safe. So how is this working? Consider three devices, one, two, and three. And each device holds data. And we want to compute the mean of these numbers without the data leaving the device. So what we can do is we compute the mean on each of the devices. So the, the mean between one and two is one and a half, between three and four, it is three and a half, and between five and six, it's five and a half. So if you now sum up those numbers, you get 10 and a half, and you divide by three, you get three and a half. And let's double check if this is correct. So it's six plus five, is 11 plus 4 is 15 plus 3 is 18 plus 2 is 20 plus 1 is 31 and divided by 6 this is 3 and a half because 3 times 6 is 18 and the half of 6 is 21 okay so you see here a little problem because all the intermediate sums are still sent to a central entity that means you can infer what the data might look like. Even if you compute aggregations, so if you reduce the number of individual data points, that is called an aggregation. So one example from aggregation is computing the mean, another one is computing the sum or a simple count. Those are all aggregations and they are removing information, but still they might give you some capabilities of fingerprinting people. So you can move this to another model. This is a ring topology. So each device sends its intermediate results to the next device and only the last device then gets the actual data and computes the mean and sends that to the cloud. So there's a little error. I just realized the 10.5 divided by three that should be computed on device three and not in the cloud. Anyway, you see here device one computes the mean 1.5, sends the mean to device two. Device two takes its own mean, which is 3.5, and adds then 1.5 and sends it to device three. And then uh, 1.5 plus 3.5 is five. And the mean between five and six is 5.5. So you get 10.5. And now if you move the division by three also to device three, then uh, it's perfectly safe. So this works not only for computing means. Actually, we have a proven model that federated learning works also on a large scale because all parallel machine learning and deep learning model training is done in that way. So this is called data parallelism or also known as Jeff Dean style parameter averaging. This is invented by Google when they built the Google Brain and actually everybody's using that. So we are using that within IBM. So it's a community approach. And the idea is the following. You deploy the model to different nodes. So the very same model, as you might remember, a model consists of model parameters and some rules how the parameters are actually incorporated into the model and you partition the data. So here you have three partitions and you train the model on each node with the data partition. So with only one third of the data. This means the model parameters are being updated. So most likely you're using some sort of gradient descent. And after a while, so after one epoch or one iteration, you send your learned parameters to the parameter server and the parameter server is just averaging the 
parameters and sending them back. Let me just explain the two terms, epoch and iteration. Uh, epoch in machine learning or deep learning, we call when we have shown the model all data points exactly once. So that we call an epoch. An iteration is something smaller. So often we use mini batch gradient descent. So we update the parameters after only a subset of the data, for example, 16 or 64 or 256 examples. And then we update the parameters. So we can choose when we synchronize the parameters, but it turns out that this really works nicely. So this way we can train deep learning networks on huge clusters. We started with 16,000 cores, but there is actually no limit. So you see here, you have a proven implementation of such uh, distributed model training system. So if you want to turn this into federated learning, the only catch you need to make sure is that the connections between the models and the parameter server is the bottleneck. So if you are in a mobile, mobile device context, the possibility to synchronize the parameters is less and therefore the convergence of the model might be worse. Therefore, TensorFlow has published a library which is called TensorFlow Federated. And actually, I don't know whether Christina is in the call. She's, uh, she has done her master thesis with us and actually just told me that she finds TensorFlow Federated not yet production ready. So it's not so easy to implement a federated learning system in TensorFlow Federated, but they are working on it. And she also told me that the Gboard, so the Google keyboard on Android is based on TensorFlow Federated Learning. So in theory, the stuff what you type shouldn't end up on Google servers. Unfortunately, Gboard isn't open source, so there is no way to really prove that. It's very unfortunate. The next thing is homomorphic encryption. This is pretty cool, so let me just explain how this works. So let's consider you have a device which has also a data on it and uh, one and two. So you apply a certain type of encryption. Actually, they are using algebraic rings, but that's beyond the scope of this here because I need to understand it first before I can explain it. So I'm working heavily on that. So um, it seems that you need to have a PhD in math to understand it. It's, it's quite heavy math. You don't need to have a PhD to understand deep learning, but for that stuff, maybe you need one. But let's, let's actually see whether I can um, break it down for you in a future version of this presentation. So you see here, we encrypt the data. So on device two, which is, for example, the cloud, we apply an operation like addition or multiplication. And all those papers, they actually start with implementing a, a NAND gate. So for those who don't know, a NAND gate is very interesting to theoretical computer scientists because with a NAND gate, you can derive all the other logic gates. And if you have derived all the other logic gates, then you are Turing complete. So in other words, if you can compute a NAND operation on the encrypted data, you are already in the game. So let's consider this addition here you see that the result of the addition is also encrypted. And now the cool thing comes into play. We are sending this result of the addition back to the device, to the original device. We decrypt it and we get an unencrypted result. That means the complete Turing complete operations can be performed on the cloud, on the encrypted data without anybody knowing what's inside. And there are very interesting applications. So now you can, for example, send all your DNA to the cloud and issue operations and searches on a set of genomes. 
or you can, for example, ask your mobile device where the next restaurant is without disclosing your location and the type of query. So you won't be profiled anymore. So you see here, in, if you go back to the original picture, you have a mobile device, you query the model with encrypted data and the model returns encrypted data and only you know the result. So formerly this was like a huge and big dream because it was computationally very intensive and also it introduces error. But now we came up with a library which actually uses state-of-the-art homomorphic encryption algorithms but solves the performance issue. So this is an example public publication of a project where we use this library. And as you can see here, you can use it in production because the ROC curve, so the performance of the algorithm on the plain text model training is nearly the same as on the encrypted model. In the publication, there is no clear statement on the performance loss, on the, let's say, the, the uh, throughput loss, because the, it, it introduces overhead, but um, they stated that it is reasonable. You can have a look at this library here. It's open source. I think it's Apache 2 license, and the publication you can just uh, search and, and read. So this solves the data privacy problem. And this also solves the information cartels problem. There is a third way of doing stuff. This is called differential privacy. So I haven't had time to dig into this, um, but I'm sharing all my presentations and um, talks online. You can check them out on github.com slash my name slash Romeo Kinsler slash me. And I will definitely update it in the next couple of weeks. And now I'm ready for taking questions, comments, additions, complaints, suggestions, feedbacks, and anything else you like. Uh, thank you, Romeo, for the presentation. Um, to kick us off, I actually have a question. So what do you think stands in the way of um, widespread adoption of these techniques today? Like what is what is like a feasible roadmap to, to having more um, privacy and having these techniques deployed in the apps that we use every day? Um, and like what would be, you know, in the way of that today? Yeah, I would say it's uh, mostly usability at the moment. So I got uh, feedback from Christina and she told me it's not so easy to just write a Keras model and deploy that on a, in a federated environment. So that is something which definitely will come soon, I hope. Um, she also told me that we should have a look at uh, Apache Spark again because the federation model is, is simpler there. But still, it's not an easy thing at the moment. And the same holds maybe even more for homomorphic encryption. So I just wanted to start with that. So I had to clone the repository. I had to compile the library. And then I opened the C++ file, which looked really, really strange to me. So what we need is a Python API that everybody can use. And that's definitely something which will come. So this publication, which I showed you with respect to homomorphic encryption, is relatively new. And it is, signifies a breakthrough. Because before that, it was nearly impossible to use that into production, uh, to use that in production, because the performance overhead was so high 
that has now been mitigated. So it's not on the algorithmic improvement. The algorithms are quite old in the 70s, from the 70s, some of, of the 70s. But the performance improvement is what makes the difference. And now if we get the usability that the ordinary data scientists uh, in the Python world can use it, then the widespread adoption will come. Makes sense. Uh, wh what about like the wider ecosystem? Um, you know, like what about in terms of in terms of adoption? Do you think there are any kind of cultural or or uh, or, or, or or things that aren't necessarily like technical barriers? Um, but um, like like you know, because because in terms of because solving the the usability issue, like um, does it like unlocks the the ability for anyone to build their application? Um, yeah. I don't know what you mean. Doesn't necessarily mean that people will be incentivized to do so. Yeah, so, so I'm wondering have, what. Yeah, we what have learned our lessons. Uh, yeah, so, could, so we have. Uh, could uh, unlock that. Yeah, we have implemented some other, or an open source, some other libraries, all uh, in the ecosystem of trusted AI. So, model bias detection, ex, um, adversarial robustness tests. And the first thing we did is we donated this to the Linux Foundation AI, so it's under open governance. And second, we have now an implementation in scikit-learn. So if you are using scikit-learn, the latest versions, you get these libraries. And I think that's the way forward. So uh, our center is basically helping with that because what IBM Research gives us is very nerdy. No? It's a publication and it's a reference implementation uh, on GitHub and that's it. And we take it from there and make it more consumable. So that's, mm -hmm. if it's not more consumable, then basically we failed. Yeah. Me and my team, we failed. Right, uh, Romeo, uh, thanks for the talk. I uh, have a question as well. So given that uh, you say, well, what you said about um, there's a very new uh, uh, development in, in the sense of like it going into production and it might be a few years before we see widespread adoption, um, how do you assess the current state of um, uh, how we deal with data privacy uh, in machine learning, um, are there uh, a lot of uh, risk and uh, loopholes that you see uh, with how people deal with this issue at the moment? Yeah, I think it's getting worse. So I have read the news and it's, I'm not sure whether it's fake news or not, but it seems that the British government has sold all the citizen data to Palantir. So this is not confirmed, but you see, and for one dollar. So that's actually showing us how much the British government values uh, citizen data. And in my opinion, we need to have privacy by design so that the math and the implementation prevents such things from happening. Because you can trust somebody now, but maybe not in a year. So the world is changing fast. Um, GDPR was a leap forward, so that's pretty cool. But still, this doesn't solve the problem of changing legislatives and changing the way of how data is treated. And also the, the information cartel problem we still have. Because if you have, if you are GDPR compliant, you still can, let's say, misuse or uh, repurpose the data. And it's hard to prove that you didn't. So I'm a huge fan of privacy by design. And that's, I think, the next wave which we are expecting. And actually, IBM announced to um, stop the face recognition business. So, so we actually we listen to our fellow humans, human beings on planet Earth. And uh, actually, that's a pretty cool thing, no? Cool, thanks. Um, cool. Do we have any questions from um, anyone? Um, Everybody shy. You can also unmute yourself, <laughs> maybe. If you wanna just ask. yeah. If you if you are talking, uh, just check that you are not on mute. <laughs> oh. 
All right. Okay. So, um, so uh, if there's no further questions, or if you think of uh, any uh, questions later on during the session, or even after today, um, um, maybe there's a way to reach you as well, Romeo, or would uh, yeah. So yeah. if you go to uh, it's in the chat GitHub slash Romeo slash me. Uh, actually, as I told you, I'm a huge fan of privacy by design. So I put uh, some secure messaging services there, uh, including uh, BitMessage and uh, Matrix. So just ping me there. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Romeo. Thank you once Back again. Down. That was a great talk. Um, and um, right. So now I think we're ready for our second talk. Uh, and second talk will be uh, by Ryan. He's going to talk to us more about uh, building modern data lakes. So, um, Ryan, the stage is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, David. And uh, are you guys able to see my presentation? Yep. Yep. And it's full screen as well. Mm hmm. Yes. Cool. Uh, well, thanks for coming, everyone. And um, thanks to Romeo and IBM for uh, giving the cool talk earlier and for hosting the event. So today I wanted to talk about um, sort of where Dremio kind of sees uh, modern cloud data lake architecture going. So um, there's a lot of words there. I'll unwrap that a bit. First off, we all have we have all probably seen some data lakes, and we all know about the data swamp. Um, so, what what's new and what's exciting that actually makes this uh, modern and cloud based? So, uh, we'll get going. Uh, I think first I'll describe data lakes and kind of walk through the current state, and then I'll discuss um, where where I think these things are going, and then talk about some of the technologies around why why I or why Dremio thinks things are going this way. So first off, uh, when I talk about data lakes in this talk, what I'm primarily talking about is the cloud object stores. So by that, I mean S3, ADLS. Um, some of the, there's a lot of S3 sort of knockoffs coming out as well for those people who are on-prem. Um, Hadoop is here, but I don't think Hadoop is really what we would call modern anymore. Um, so <clears throat> one of the reasons that people are starting to look at data lakes again is it's so easy to get data into it. You really just throw data at the data lake and the data lake fills up um, and it's super cheap. You can hold multiple terabytes in data lakes for relatively cheap and it pretty much scales infinitely. As long as you, as long as you have the network power to put data in there, you can put data in so <clears throat> we're seeing a lot of growth in data lakes. We're seeing a lot of uh, people start using data lakes as their primary, um, as their system of record, which is, which is, I think, relatively new and interesting. Before we would put our, we'd assume our system of record would live in something more stable like a database. But now we're saying everything and anything lands in a data lake, and then that's, that's the, uh, the official gold source of it. But as with anything like that, you end up in the problem that your data lake can become disorganized, messy, uh, out of date. You don't know what's in there, that kind of stuff. And um, it's hard to actually get at the data. So you can't, um, sure, you could point a Jupyter notebook at a particular file in a data lake or a set of files. But you can't really write SQL against a data lake or start imagining building this into dashboards or into some other um, analytics processes. Uh, so it's just too slow and too hard. So um, that kind of set leads us towards uh, the next slide here, which I call sort of the, the pyramid of pain. Um, anyone <laughs> who spent any time in data engineering probably recognizes this. But um, I'll walk through it just, just to be sure and to make sure that everyone is feeling the same pain that I felt having to work on a system like this. So <clears throat> once you get your data into your data lake, uh, how do you get it to your to your analyst, to your data scientist, to people who are actually going to make decisions with this data? Well, like I said in the last slide, it's not very easy to just query that data directly. 
So what we start doing is building up um, data warehouses usually. So data warehouses are nice because they have SQL interfaces typically, they're structured, you understand the schemas, that kind of stuff. But uh, data warehouses can very quickly and very um, insidiously become um, ludicrously expensive. So you have this extremely expensive architecture and you end up having multiple copies of your data. And worst off, this data may or may not actually live in your own system anymore. Um, so you kind of lose control of your own data. And to get this data into the data warehouse, you're typically going to be writing tons of uh, ETL jobs. And that leads to this entire ecosystem of ETL tools where you have to manage jobs and acyclic, directed acyclic graphs of jobs and schedules and all kinds of other stuff. So you end up in this relatively brittle and complex architecture that requires constant modeling just to get your data into this expensive data warehouse. But typically that doesn't really satisfy your end users. Typically that's not quite fast enough or um, certainly not cheap enough if you're gonna be writing a lot of queries against your data warehouse, cloud data warehouse. So what people end up doing is start introducing another layer of technologies and these technologies might be um, cubing or data virtualization technologies. It could be extracts for your BI tools or whatever else. So you end up with this, this relatively complex pyramid here and uh, you're spending a lot of money and you're using a lot of your own time to kind of keep this up and running. I think this is, as a data engineer, this is the worst thing about my job as I was spending all this time sort of curating this, this architecture instead of building fun, cool things directly with my data scientists. And I think for uh, if you're an analyst or a person making decisions with this data, you really run into the problem that your um, your data is quite stale by the time it gets to your to your Tableau or to your Jupyter notebook or something. And I think that's the worst part is um, you may end up waiting as much as months to get your data through the system to where it can be made, where you can start making decisions on it. I always say that uh, data is like fish; after a few days, it starts to sink. So you need to get your data out there and start making decisions with it as soon as possible. So <clears throat> what now what is the right way to design a data like that? If we, if we want to move away from this ugly architecture, what can we do instead? Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do, but I think to start, let's talk about one of the things that you absolutely need, some of the sort of base considerations you need to think about. The first one, possibly the simplest one, is I want my data to stay in my account. Um, if I write data into S3, I want it to live in S3 in perpetuity. I don't want to have to copy it to Redshift or even worse, copy it out of my system into another system. And I really want to maintain as few copies as possible. Every time I copy the data, I have another chain in my lineage, another difficulty in keeping track of the who, what, and why of the data and its value. So let's keep all of our data in our data lake without copying. I also want to mandate that my data is going to be stored in open data formats. So that could be anything from uh, Parquet, which is fairly ubiquitous and what, what I prefer personally. Um, you know, any other, the Apache ones, Apache Oric, obviously JSON or CSV is, is technically speaking open, so that works as well. What we're trying to do here is make sure that we're future-proofing ourselves and making sure that if something new and fun comes along, Spark, Super Spark. I can immediately point Super Spark at my Parquet files and turn off Spark without having to plan a two-year migration. Um, and that leads to the last, the last precept is um, I should be able to choose which data I apply to my data, uh, which tool I apply to my data. So if I, if I put my data in a data warehouse, the only real thing I can do with it is query it with the data warehouse. I can't um, point Spark. Well, I mean, you can point Spark at it, but then you need this extra layer of the connectivity to the database. But the idea is if it's living in an open file format on a data lake, I should be able to use any tool I want on it without having to um, take too many considerations into the file formats. So given that, this is sort of a, a block diagram of what I think a modern data lake would look like, particularly suited for analytics. Um, 
So I think at the bottom, we obviously have the files. These are the actual individual files that live on the data lake. Uh, those files are then organized into tables. Um, that step is necessary for getting away from your data swamp. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the next slide. And we have compute. The compute is basically a SQL engine or something like Spark, which is actually writing queries against these tables and then producing results. And then we need to get those uh, results to people via JDBC or Aeroflight or something like that. Uh, down here, I have some uh, relational data stores. Uh, unfortunately, those will always exist, and our compute engine should really be able to take that into account. And uh, through all of this, we really need to consider security. Um, that should be one security system from bottom to top, and it should uh, give us comfort around things like GR, GDPR or something like that. And it should know who is, ask, who is accessing what at all times. So <clears throat> I think this is all well and good, and this is the way everyone would probably like to see their data lake instead of this, this pyramid of all kinds of architect of technologies. Where this has fallen down in the past is some of the um, some of the open source technologies particularly haven't been able to stand up to um, to the expectations of our data analyst, uh, data scientists. Uh, I think Aero and Iceberg, which I'll talk about in a second, are really the two open source technologies that are pushing this uh, analytics system into the into some into the realm of possibility, I guess. And then the other key component is the compute engine. Uh, we've had engines like Hive or something like that that have been around forever and have been technically able to query S3, but they're going to be slow and they're going to be finicky and they have a lot of overhead to run. So we need a compute engine that can actually write SQL or something like SQL against the data lake and return it in um, in the speed of thought or, or near real-time analytics. And that's a big ask. Um, I think, obviously, working at Dremio, I think Dremio is the, the tool for that. And I'll get into why I think that later. But um, Dremio is supported by open source architectures, open source projects. So I'd like to focus on, on kind of that stuff for now. So <clears throat> I'm going to skip over files. Obviously, all these files are open source technologies. We already know as much as we can about Parquet or something like that. It's become relatively um, commodity software for us now. So let's move up, up one level in the stack and start talking about tables. So by tables, what I mean is something that um, organizes your data, uh, allows for things like transactions and particularly schema changes. Um, and then it should be able to help us with uh, query planning and query processing, as well as being able to deal with uh, things like partitions and time travel, get into time travel a bit. But we should be able to deal with partitions without having to explicitly reference the directory that our data structures are under. So <clears throat> all of these things will allow a SQL engine, for example, to actually query data on the data lake with a sensible return time. Here's some examples down here we have of, um, of tables, I guess, or of catalogs that exist already. Obviously, the simplest is files and directories. You say all of your data lives under folder X, and that folder X is partitioned by, by date. That works quite well if you have a static schema and you don't have a whole lot of data where you need to do, say, partition pruning. But it, uh, it sort of strains when you start talking about petabytes or terabytes even of data. Obviously, it's quite nice because it's open source and it's simple and it's not ever going to be taken away. But, um, but it's not transactional. It doesn't really have the, um, the features that we'd want out of something that would compete with, say, data warehouses in this kind of space. Another one we can think about is Hive Metastore. Hive Metastore is obviously been around for ages. Uh, and it does a lot of the stuff we want. It's a community project. It's open source. But it's, um, it's not going to do very well with transactions unless you're using um, asset work on HDFS. But at least it's a step in the right direction over files. Uh, AWS Glue, relatively new. Um, obviously, it's closed source. And it's really just a half-baked um, rewrite of Hive Metastore. 
So it can do some of the stuff that Hive Metastore can, but not all the stuff. Um, and it's not going to do stuff like transactions, and it's it's certainly just driven by AWS. We have no real control over where that's heading. And then there's two more here, and a third one, which I actually forgot to put on the slide, which is called Hootie. And uh, all three of these are sort of your um, what I what I think of as your next generation table uh, formats. So. Uh, Delta Lake is being run by Databricks. It's relatively new as well. And it, um, it has a lot of stuff we need. It can do transactions, and it supports Parquet, other open for formats. But it's not entirely open source. So it's the project is released as a Apache 2 licensed software on GitHub. And it's a Linux foundation adopted as well. But some of the endpoints that that function, that that uh, Delta Lake needs to function on uh, cloud data on cloud data warehouses. Cloud data lakes isn't actually uh, open sourced, so you can use it, and it's open source, but only if you're also using Databricks as your um, primary tool. And finally, one thing that I'm super excited about right, about right now is Iceberg. And Iceberg has all of the conditions we want. It's fully open sourced. It's supports all the file formats, and it has a rich um, community around it of a lot of different people contributing to it. And it has some transactions. So this is, uh, this is what Dremio's thinking about adopting, and it's really um, exciting from our perspective. Um, and it was actually just re uh, recently picked up as a full Apache uh, project remote compared to the incubator. So <clears throat> a little bit more about this. As you can see, there's a lot of people already contributing, contributing to it. It was just released as a full Apache project last week, I believe. And, um, and it has a lot of the features that we're looking for in a, in a cloud data lake uh, table format. So we can query all of our data lakes. We can query data on-prem. Uh, it has all of the transactions we want. Uh, it can't. When it's doing transactions, it can only do transactions at the partition or file level. It's not able to do individual records, but that's progressing quite quickly. And soon we'll be able to perform transactions on the data lake on single records. And then because of its architecture, it's able to give us a lot of um, things like partition pruning and a lot of statistics and stuff, which help queries go faster. And uh, query planning is much faster because of the way it's um, the way it's uh, architected, say, compared to Hive. So it's a lot faster to collect and process metadata, and uh, and the way it processes with the metadata means it's faster to actually execute the queries. So I'll spend a little bit of, uh, I'll go through this relatively quickly. This is the um, file format, the uh, structure of Iceberg, the architecture of Iceberg. Um, compared to something like Hive, it's actually, rather than a database that's external, which requires API calls, it's actually going to be uh, the metadata files are stored right next to your data on the data warehouse. Data lake, excuse me. So this allows for much faster evaluation and much uh, tighter integration between the data and the, and the overlying data structure that defines the schemas and stuff. So at a very simplistic level, an iceberg table metadata is going to be composed of uh, snapshots. And a snapshot is, you can think of a set of snapshots, say S1, S2, S3 here, as a, a linear history of your table. And each snapshot is going to be a list of manifest files. And then when you file those, follow those manifest files down, you, the manifest files are really just a list of data files. It's slightly more complicated than that because the snapshot manifest files have to store um, partition information, scheme information, and uh, statistics on the data and stuff like that. But at its heart, it's a relatively simple, here's all the files in my table. And what's interesting about this is we can, um, a transaction is then performed by writing new manifest files and new snapshots. So if we were to, in this example, we uh, rewrite D1 and we replace it with D1 prime. So Iceberg will write manifest M1 prime and snapshot two will point it at this new uh, manifest file. 
Similarly, if we add a new Parquet file, we might get a new manifest file. Um, and then our third snapshot is going to be composed of the of manifest M1 and M, uh, M1 prime and M2. So it's relatively straightforward. And this uh, allows us to start thinking about uh, time travel. So we can actually choose which snapshot we'll read the data at. And we can move back to, say, a snapshot last week and find out how the data looked last week. And as long as the snapshot still exists, the data still exists. So we have this really interesting feature of being able to watch how our uh, data evolved and um, and start and start querying that data forward and backward in time. The the other key point about this architecture is, is it sort of separates readers from writers. A reader asks Iceberg what the current up-to-date snapshot is. And in, in this example, uh, it's going to tell us that the current up-to-date snapshot is S2. So the reader is going to be reading S2, and it's going to see only these two data files and be able to query only those two. Meanwhile, simultaneously, the writer is actually writing uh, snapshot S3. So then the writer is actually making a transaction while the reader is still able to read. And it's only when the writer finishes this transaction and instructs Iceberg to point its root pointer to the S3 snapshot that the reader will see S3 and all the data below it. So it's a really simple, really scalable way to, um, to execute transactions on, on a data lake on a set of parquet files living somewhere in, say, S3. So I guess if there's any questions immediately about that, I can stop here and answer questions. If not, I'm going to move on to uh, Arrow. Um, I, I have one question. Sure. Um, how does the um, iceberg compare to the, the Delta Lake in terms of architecture? They're actually surprisingly, shockingly similar. Um, mm -hmm. The, the key differences are uh, how Iceberg and Delta Lake inform the reader what the currently active snapshot is. So in this case, um, in this diagram, R is reading S2, the reader is reading S2. Iceberg needs a, a Hive Metastore or some atomic data, uh, uh, some atomic file system to be able to move um, the root snapshot. Whereas Delta Lake, the way to do that with Delta Lake is to have a Databricks proprietary endpoint. So you're, that's really the main difference between the two is that you're required to point, um, you're required to have a uh, Data Lake instance running to be able to move your snapshots forward in time. There's other low level architectural decisions, but that's really the key, the important one. I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, like, uh, when when does the iceberg like remove uh, a snapshot? Because I can imagine that if we start to rewrite uh, data very like in a continuous way, at some point the data are just outdated, and we would eliminate them. Or isn't this the case? Yeah. The um, I don't remember by default, how many snapshots are kept. I think it's something along the, on the order of like 32 or 64 snapshots are kept. After that, we start uh, reaping old data and old snapshots and manifest files. That's also configurable. Um, with the introduction of row of row level uh, transactions in Iceberg, we are actually introducing the concept of garbage collection as well, which is a more, um, I guess a more fundamental activity which involves reaping these old data files. So this is collapsing a bunch of data files into singular, a few data set of files and uh, deleting all the old stuff. So this all has to happen in, in the background of Iceberg. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And that's also a master slave architecture, I guess. Uh, sorry, what was that? You broke up for something. Is it like a master slave architecture where you have like a, a master like uh, keeping track of the snapshots and eliminating them? Or not? Yeah, 
Right now, there's no master as such. Every iceberg uh, client is able to take actions as he or she wishes. The only central point of um, of coordination is this atomic root pointer store, as as we call it. Um, that that is the one that has to be atomically switched. Other than that, all the iceberg clients are independent, and then an iceberg client has to t has to say, "Oh, there's too many snapshots. I'm going to go and." delete all the old snapshots. Or we might have a process running as part of our ETL pipeline, which says um, double check all of our tables aren't too old and clean up anything that's that doesn't need to exist anymore. Thank you. Uh, does it does Iceberg support upsearch was the question. It doesn't right now, but it will with the um, with the impending row level updates. So in that case, uh, upsert is a combination of a insert, a delete, and a, a modify, I believe. But it's all these actions are then combined together into one atomic transaction to make sure your, your root pointer store moves in, in coordination. So hopefully by the end of the summer, the row level stuff will be finished and we'll be able to use that in production. Okay, so moving on to Arrow. Uh, Arrow, I guess first off, how many people have actually heard of Arrow? Just if you haven't, maybe give a shout or a chat or something. So I think, um, as you can see from the diagram, Arrow is pretty much in everything that we use as data scientists and data engineers. But uh, I think it's, for me at least, it seems to, to live under the, under the hood or under the radar most, most of the time. But it's, as you can see, it's, it's in tons of different libraries. It's the number of downloads and the people using it has been growing exponentially since it was released. And uh, we've had, I think it's been 17 releases since the initial release in December of 2016. So it's a, a very rapidly growing project that has a huge number of contributors and is supported across a broad range of architectures, operating systems, and programming languages. So I think as far as native bindings go, Java, C, C++, uh, Rust, and maybe one or two others, uh, have arrow bindings written in the, in the native language. And then things like Python and JavaScript and stuff are actually using lower level libraries. But it means these these arrow in-memory data structures are actually available in a broad range of clients, uh, architectures, and OSs. So that's great. Everyone loves arrow, apparently, and everyone's using it. But what actually is it? So at its heart, arrow is simply a, a specification. So it describes how to lay out data in memory in a binary format. And this in-memory data layout is um, is optimized for modern analytics workloads on CPUs and GPUs. So it takes into consideration the way modern architectures pipeline and thread processes and uh, data, and it takes into consideration caching and all these kinds of things uh, to ensure that the data is laid out optimally to do interesting analytical work on it. Aside from the standard, it's it's also a collection of, set of tools. So you have things like um, Aeroflight, which we'll get onto in a bit. We have uh, data kernels to, to compute um, different uh, atomic operations. We have um, things like a JDBC interface, things to read Parquet files, Avro files, all kinds of stuff like that, and in all kinds of different languages as well. And all these tools combine together with this format to create sort of a, a Lego set for doing interesting things with data in memory. So that's what it is. What it isn't then is it's not an installable system. It, it's, as I said, it's these Lego things. You can't download and install a pat, uh, arrow and run it. Likewise, it's not a memory grid or an in-memory cache or anything like that, though you can actually use these Lego bricks to, to, bricks to build an in-memory cache, for example. 
And one important distinction is it's not really designed for streaming operations. So streaming operations are typically going to be one or maybe a few records long. And uh, the overhead of storing things in a columnar format makes it actually not very efficient to stream data with a, with a, with Apache Arrow. So I kind of gave away the exciting part of the Arrow columnar format is it's, it's a columnar format. So um, in memory, your data is going to be stored column-wise instead of row-wise. So you can see traditionally things would be stored as uh, per row. So session ID, timestamp, source, source IP, all through the rows. What Arrow does differently is uh, similar to Parquet and other few other data formats is it stores every column in a contiguous block of memory. So if you want to, say, compute your max session ID for some reason, instead of going to row one, cell one, taking that value, calculating how to get to row two, cell one, row three, cell one, row four, cell one, doing all the work to move through that data set, you literally just say, okay, I'm going to take four times the long width in memory and pull that all into your CPU. And with that, you're able to pull contiguous blocks of memory into your CPU so you can start using your cache locality and uh, pipelining and even uh, SIMD instructions. So you're really able to give a significant boost over how arrow memory is, is moved through your computer and how it's processed compared to traditional memory. So I think that that's really why arrow has become so important is it's a, it's a lingua, franca, lingua franca for how to store memory and data in memory to do analytics on. And this lingua franca is designed such that it's inherently fast. So <clears throat> as I said, there's a handful of building blocks in Arrow. Um, I won't go into all of these. Uh, I'm going to highlight uh, a flight in the last part of the talk and get even next. But there's also the feather format, which if you're familiar with R and Python, it's a really quick way to move data between those two languages, sort of an ephemeral um, ephemeral version of Parquet, effectively. And then the Parquet format, which is also columnar stored, is uh, very similar in structure to how Arrow stores memory. So it, it's very, very efficient to move data between Parquet and Arrow. And we've developed a C++ library that, that does that in an in extremely fast and efficient manner. Finally, we have Gandiva and Aeroflight. Aeroflight is the RPC mechanism, which I'll get to in a second. And Gandiva is a, sort of a execution kernel in Arrow. And what this allows you to do is specify a uh, expression or some operations. Maybe it's a filter statement or a projection on a SQL query or something. And what's going to happen to that expression is it'll actually get compiled into uh, bytecode using the LLVM compiler. That means you're always getting the fastest possible um, machine level code for every execution, for every expression you can imagine. So at a high level, this is how it works. We have our expression tree that can be x times y, or if x is greater than 10, multiply by 2, else divide by 2, whatever. And this is going to be fed into our compiler. And this is going to use LLVM to convert it into LLVM's bytecode representation, which then uses LLVM's compiler to actually compute, uh, compile machine code. Then when we're running these, uh, this machine code, this expression against our arrow batches, our stream of arrow records, we're going to execute it against this machine level code rather than against a Java or JavaScript or Ruby or whatever else expression. So now we're getting, we're able to code in a high level programming language, and we know that our arrow batches are actually being processed in uh, at, mach at machine code speeds. And that results in, depending on the expression, fairly significant uh, upticks in performance, and uh, particularly if you're processing the same expressions over, over and over again on, error, on large sets of arrow batches. Some of the things that come in the future is this doesn't really leverage the SIMD era ex, uh, architectures or any of the other fancier portions of, um, of modern CPU architecture. So it's not as fast as hand coding C or C++ against your arrow batches, but um, 
these are some of the things we're working on in the background to make this truly uh, exceptionally fast. And one thing I, I think is really nifty and I like to highlight is um, how these operations are able to be uh, pipelined for, for speed. So every, um, every arrow buffer also contains a validity buffer. And this validity buffer is just a, uh, a bunch of bits. And each bit tells you if the corresponding record in the corresponding row in your data is null or not. So now you can think of some really interesting applications. If you were to add these two data sets together, what you're going to be doing is doing a bitwise AND on your two validity buffers and your add instruction, perhaps it's a SIMD add instruction, on the data. And then when you combine those back together, you, um, you have the correct validity buffer next to the correct data buffer still. So your, your data, which uh, has your validity byte off, so it's null data, you still did the add on that data set, and the resulting add is junk. However, you don't really care because your bitwise buffer, your bit buffer still tells you that it's null. And what the reason for doing this, the really important thing about doing this is you can start using things like SIMD instructions and other um, pipelining operations and GPUs and stuff. So in this case, it's actually cheaper to do a, to calculate uh, this addition and then throw it out because the, the bit is null than it is to constantly have all these nesting and branching and if statements to, to figure out if your uh, data is null before adding it. So it's a really powerful, really simple technique that allows, again, is, is allowing Arrow to move super fast. So um, <clears throat> finally, I'd like to talk briefly about Arrow Flight. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. I guess I got 10, 15 minutes left, 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. So Arrow Flight is, um, is the last piece of the puzzle for Aero, for the Aero community to bring this uh, data lingua franca in, in place. So what we have here is a wire protocol, which allows us to move Aero buffers between machines and between systems. So obviously it's focused on bulk transfer, but it um, at its base, it's going to be a zero copy method to move a data buffer from computer A directly onto its onto the wire and then back into an arrow buffer in memory on computer B. And it does this by having a on the wire protocol that's identical to the in memory protocol and using uh, leveraging some of the uh, lower level functionalities of uh, gRPC in this case to, to actually perform uh, zero copy um, movement of this data. So it's built to be parallel, it's built to be fast, and obviously it's built to be cross-platform. And it was also designed to put security in mind. So it's trivial to fire up a Arrow flight server in Python and get um, SSL uh, encryption, um, access control, and everything else right out of the box with, with this Arrow flight server. So here's an example of, of what uh, an arrow flight operation would actually look like. So we can support a number of operations in arrow flight. So we can do things like uh, do get or do put, which is uh, the client saying, give me data or here's some data for you to store. And we can also do operations like uh, negotiating um, which data sets are available, which data sets I might want or not want, and what their schemas are. So in this case, we're actually going to do a parallel do get. And how that works is the client is first going to send uh, a get flight info gRPC call with a SQL statement. So in this case, Dremio's coordinator is going to uh, compile that SQL, do all the planning, do all it needs to do, and then what will return to the client is um, a flight info, which is going to be composed of the schema of the resulting SQL query and a list of endpoints. And the endpoints are going to be basically um, uh, host name port pairs, and then a ticket is sort of a uh, ephemeral object which allows you to uh, go to the server and redeem it for data. 
So with this list of uh, endpoints, we can then query all these uh, locations in parallel. Now, this list is such that we could um, query uh, query these in, in serial. We could query endpoint one, two, and three, and four, or we can query them in parallel, or we can query them in parallel on uh, from multiple clients. So if we had a Spark cluster, for example, we could push each of these endpoints to a separate uh, Spark executor and then have the Spark executors face off directly against, in this case, the Dremio executors, resulting in sort of a, an extremely parallelized version of this, um, what is effectively a JDBC or ODBC operation. So that's exactly what we did with our uh, Spark source for flight that's been um, recently put up on GitHub. What that's doing is use uh, leveraging Spark's uh, data source V2 um, API. So we're able to query a flight Spark source, a uh, flight source, a uh, flight server, excuse me, and bring data back directly into Spark in columnar batches, which are actually backed by Arrow. So we're able to fully leverage uh, Spark's Arrow support to do this columnar. Um, calculations. And we we leverage some of the new features in data source v2 so we can actually push down portions of SQL queries and we can partition based on the arrow flight ticket and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So as a brief benchmark, we I built a Dremio uh, cluster with four nodes and an Elastic MapReduce cluster with four nodes. I had these two face off against each other to return uh, increasingly large data sizes. And so this is what the benchmark looks like in uh, each number is in seconds. So for 100,000 records, uh, JDBC took almost four seconds to return the data, um, one second of which was actually I.O. The rest was um, Spark and or Germio processing the data that was returned. You can see how this scales, particularly on the, on the parallel flight, where when we use uh, eight nodes facing off against each other, we're actually pushing a billion records in under 20 seconds, just under 20 seconds. And, um, and when you actually do all the calculations for a billion rows of the data set I was using, that's something like 80 or 100 gigabytes of data, we're actually pushing something like four or five gigabits per second across the network per node across all these nodes, we're pulling over a massive amount of data very, very quickly. Directly into our, um, again, this goes directly into uh, our Spark executors, and it's already partitioned, so we can continue to do work on this. So that's huge, really interesting applications for me in terms of uh, machine learning or something. You can pull very large data sets directly off of uh, S3 or ADLS or something like that and start doing machine learning models on it very, very quickly. And uh, that's it for the tech. I just wanted to quickly talk about, I've been talking a lot about Dremio. So Dremio is what we see as the compute layer of that architecture I showed earlier. And it, <clears throat> at its core, it's built from ground up using Arrow. Uh, we founded Apache Arrow, um, part co-founded Apache Arrow. So this is really what we think is the is the missing piece to having this next generation um, analytics on on the data lake, and because of uh, Arrow and Iceberg and all these features, um, as well as some of our more proprietary features, we're actually able to realistically do um, real time business analytics uh, queries on on the data lake. So you can have sub one second queries coming back from Tableau or pretty significant jobs happening in Python or, or Jupyter or something like that. Um, so, it's, so it's, I think, a super cool combination of all these really interesting open source technologies that really delivers on the architecture that we were dreaming about earlier in the talk. So with that, I'd just like to say thanks. Here's some links. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. Or yeah, there's my email if you want to chat offline. And thanks for listening. Thanks, Rain. Thanks, thanks for the great talk. Um, so yeah, it's uh, open to questions. If anyone, um, you know, uh, just shout if you have any question. Maybe I'll start off with um, uh, maybe the 
maybe an obvious one, uh, which is uh, how would you compare BigQuery uh, with uh, Dremio? Um, um, uh, putting the vendor lock in aside. I think um, they're actually relatively similar in the sense that uh, BigQuery is the result of the, the famous Dremel paper from Google. And uh, the DREM in Dremio comes from Dremel. So at, at its heart, the architecture is very similar. Whether they differ is the, is the vendor locking. Sure. And I saw there's a question about where is error used in Spark. So it's used in, um, in the UDFs, particularly if you write PySpark UDFs. And it's used when you translate um, Spark results back into Python results. So there's, I think that's, it's a flag enabled by default or it's a, a flag that you have to enable. But it actually uses uh, pi arrow to um, move data from Spark into pandas data frames. And then it's also used in things like the, the data source v2 to move, um, to move arrow batches through Spark. Eventually, it'll still get uh, transformed into Spark's internal data structures. But um, it's a heck of a lot better than translating from arrow to JDBC to something else to something else back finally into Spark. So. Um, I've got one more question about uh, Arrow as well. Uh, you've mentioned quite a few good things about Arrow. Um, is there anything that you think uh, can be improved for Arrow that you know you would like to see uh, it, uh, some new features being uh, developed? So yeah, I think one thing that I have just recently started working on is a is another layer over top of Flight to make something more like a, a JDBC or ODBC protocol. So Aeroflight, very nice way to translate error buffers between systems. But to actually say replace JDBC or ODBC as the standard and start gaining adoption, we need to define things like how to exchange metadata, how to negotiate catalogs and schemas and these sorts of things. Um, as well as other server side operations, sessions, these kinds of things. So being able to build that layer on top of uh, Aeroflight would be really good. Um, another piece I'm super excited about, which I don't think has been fully released, is um, Aero Datasets. And Aero Datasets is um, effectively a rewrite of Pandas in PyArrow, in Aero. So I don't know if anyone, I if I mentioned it, but uh, Wes McKinney, the uh, founder of Pandas, was one of the founders of Arrow as well. So his goal with this data set stuff is to start thinking about how to move on to the next generation of Pandas. So start pulling all the stuff out of Pandas and NumPy and start putting it into PyArrow. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's going to have a really significant effect uh, for people who are using Pandas. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Flight link is missing. We have a command from Dean. Oh, okay. I don't remember which flight link I had on there. Uh, that was probably There's one more question from Mike as well. Sorry, I'm just pulling up that. Uh... So I just added the uh, arrow log release. Uh, so regarding the Hive to Iceberg migration, not right now. Uh, there's a ton of effort going on in the community right now to make that a really smooth, clean um, transition. So 
uh, I think it's Expedia, has started moving their enormous hive metastore onto Iceberg. And they're starting to build some of the tooling in Iceberg to make that transition uh, faster and easier. So keep a watch out on the Iceberg mailing list and on GitHub. That stuff should be coming out uh, early summer, I would imagine. Cool. Um, I guess uh, there's no further question. If there's no further question, um, thank you once again to Ryan uh, and Romeo, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, yeah, I hope everyone is keeping well during this uh, challenging, interesting time, and hope we'll all be back. Uh, things will go back to normal um, relatively soon. So thank you. Thank you all once again. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, guys.